Good morning, everyone. Thanks for your participation in the inaugural Conversations in Equity and Design speaker series. My name is Molly Reichert. I'm an associate professor in the architecture department at Dunwoody College of Technology. This project is a collaboration between Dunwoody, the Walker Art Center, MSP NOMA, AIA Minnesota, and Minneapolis College. The project grew out of a desire to address and elevate questions of ethics, equity, justice, and culture in, relation to, in relationship to design practices and education. Participating speakers in the series were selected by students from Dunwoody and Minneapolis College who researched current designers working in the realm of, realm of equity. Engagement in these ideals will continue throughout the academic semester as students will meet directly with these practitioners and will serve as touchstones for constructive discourse. Please note the incredible lineup of speakers this fall and visit the URL on this splash page to register for additional events in the series. Today we are join, joined by Ronald Rael who will be in conversation with Trevor Bullen. Before I introduce them, I'd like to outline the structure of the talk today. We'll start with a 30 minute presentation by Ronald Rael. This will be followed by a 15 minute conversation between Ronald Rael and Trevor Bullen. And the last minute, 15 minutes will be devoted to a question and answer session with the audience. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please enter it in the question, in the question form at the bottom of the Zoom interface. Now I'm very happy to introduce Trevor Bullen, who is Dean, the new Dean of the New School of Design at Dunwoody. Trevor is a broadly experienced architect with over 25 years of professional experience and brings to Dunwoody significant international experience. He has worked on a wide range of architecture, landscape architecture, and planning projects in, the, in Europe, the Caribbean, and the United States. Most recently, he was Senior Associate and Director of Operations at Snow Krylik Architects, who was recipient of the 2018 AIA Architecture Firm Award. From 20, from 2000 to 2016, Trevor led an award-winning architecture firm and planning studio on the island of Grenada, completing more than 30 built projects. The work of his firm has been published extensively in journals and books, as well as being exhibited in the 2021 Architecture Biennale in Venice. I now have the pleasure of introducing Ronald Rael to the conversation. Ronald is a design activist, architectural researcher, author, and thought leader within the topics of border wall studies, earth and architecture, additive manufacturing, and emerging digital fabrication technologies. Ronald is the Eva Lee Memorial Chair in Architecture and Director of the Masters of Architecture program at UC Berkeley. He directs the Print Farm Laboratory there and is both a Bakar and Hellman Fellow. He has written several books, including Border Wall as Architecture, a Manifesto for the US-Mexico Boundary, and Earth Architecture. He's also co-founder of Rael San Fratello, which was named the 2014 Emerging Voice by the Architectural League of New York. In 2016, Rael San Fratello was awarded the Digital Practice Award of Excellence by the Association for Computer-Aided Design and Architecture. In addition to these many accolades, Rael San Fratello's teeter-totter wall was named the 2020 Beasley Design of the Year. I'm personally very happy to introduce our first keynote, as Ron was also my professor at UC Berkeley and has remained a mentor and friend since. Please help me in extending a warm welcome to Ronald Rael. Thank you so much, Molly. I'm so happy to be here. Um, <clears throat> as you may have noticed on the title, the title of my talk is called Rasquachando. What does that mean? Rasquachi is a, is a word that describes in Chicano art, doing the most with the least you have, being pr uh, proud of the accomplishments that one can have when they have very little. And my practice has been shaped by the idea of doing the most you can with the least you have for some time. And I'm gonna to try to synthesize the work of three separate research endeavors that have come about in three different publications, Border Walls Architecture, Printing Architecture, which has to do with that of manufacturing and earthen architecture, which is related to buildings constructed of earth. And while these seem as very different topics of research, they all come from a very particular place. And that place is the place where I have spent uh, most of my life, but also the entire pandemic, which is defined by borders in really interesting ways. It is a high alpine valley that crosses the border between the states of Colorado and New Mexico. It's bordered by 14,000 and 13,000 foot mountains, um, but it also, was the northernmost frontier of the territory of Mexico prior to the Mexican-American War in 1848. Now, the 
legacy of that history continues to exist in that landscape. And it's evidenced in the architecture as well as the food and the culture and the language. And in many ways, I see this as an extension of the borderlands today. Um, there are houses made out of mud brick that dot the landscape. And I'm actively today working on restoring about nine of these historic adobe structures in, that, in those villages in Southern Colorado. And I often do this with communities of people who are interested in history and restoration, uh, particularly in this uh, project, which is a Ute Indian agency built in 1854. And I try to do this work in a way that expresses and communicates the ideas of history and culture through art and design. So for example, on this project, after we, we replastered the surface with tra traditional earthen plasters, we invited the artist Chip Thomas to do a paste up mural. Chip Thomas is a very well-known graffiti artist who does paste up graffiti and a photographer. He's also a medical doctor who works on the Navajo uh, reservation. But his installation was a copy of the lists that were created in this building documenting Native American slavery in the late 1800s. It lists the names of the children who were taken captive from their parents and held in the two adjacent counties. And that installation went both on the interior and the exterior of the building as we began to restore the building and heal the site. I also used my own home, which was a home that was built by my great grandfather's sister's family as a site for teaching traditional and indigenous building practices uh, like earth and plaster, um, and also make new buildings in those communities with the communities. So this is a project that's currently underway, which is gonna be one of the largest Adobe buildings built in the state of Colorado in the last probably 170 years which is an enormous labyrinth that's related to the oldest Catholic parish in the state of Colorado, um, but done with community members. It will take about 25,000 adobe mud bricks in order to construct. So I also teach these traditional practices there in this landscape and expose them to new generations of people who have been displaced or removed from those practices. In addition to that, I teach indigenous and traditional foodways through the construction of traditional ovens, or as we call them, ornos, which I build with students and community members. And this project of the ornos has taken on a new life. It's taken on a life where these ornos have become symbols of resistance, but they're also places where people come together around fire and warmth and food. And it was recently the topic of a documentary film where I am now traveling along the US-Mexico border building mud ovens in migrant shelters, bringing the communities who've been stuck within those shelters together around food. And I'm gonna let you watch for just a bit. <laughs> Y reconstruimos la humanidad. Como te digo, soy guatemalteco. Ya no soy ningún muchacho jovencito. Eh, acostumbrado a hacer el pan de según la costumbre de nuestro pueblo. Tú me dices si se está viendo ¿no? para poner más madera. Porque ya estamos incluso. <laughs> So there, there's a lovely moment in that scene where they ask the nun who takes care of the shelter and runs the shelter what it is we're building here. And because I'm very interested in new ways of building, her answer is really meaningful to me because we're building an oven in the background, but her answer to the question, what are you building here by the documentary filmmakers isn't answered by we're building an oven. She replies, we're building, mm, we're rebuilding. We're not building, we're rebuilding humanity. We're rebuilding people who have suffered traumas uh, along a journey that they have taken and we're rebuilding them emotionally, physically, spiritually before they continue their journey north. And so these ovens as kind of acts of resistance have taken on a new life, not only at the border, 
but all around the, the country as well. Recently, I was involved in a project called Truth Farm in Charlottesville, Virginia. And it's a Truth Farm is a tiny sliver of land that's surrounded by the Donald Trump winery. And it's become a site for thinking about art related to immigration. And so the table that you see is by the artist Ana Teresa Fernandez. And my little oven is here in the back, sort of in this cluster of trees by this truck. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but um, this oven has also been a kind of an act of resistance within the island that is surrounded by the Trump winery built out of mud bricks that come from Colorado from an old abandoned Mexican American schoolhouse. And this is that truth orno, as we call it, that is a place where in that context, the people can gather around again, food and fire and break bread and be served on the truth table as people enjoying or at least drinking the wine of Donald Trump from the from the tasting rooms above, look down at the truth table in a conversation about what exactly is truth. My interest in new ways of building span into new technologies and forms of building, particularly with materials that are traditional like earth. And six years ago, I began a project called G-Code Clay. I did not know it then that this would create an entirely new movement in the ceramics world about how one would print uh, and, and make objects made out of clay. But at that time, six or seven years ago, we were making objects that look like this. Or like this. And the goal being that I was curious to know if it was possible to 3D print at large scales using clay. Um, and these became experiments in that process, but they evolved into really interesting textures and possibilities and became very much a part of the way today people are thinking about how one 3D prints ceramics. But the endeavor was much larger. It was thinking about how these are not objects and vessels or vases unto themselves, but experiments in thinking about how we might make new kinds of textures on sustainable materials for architecture and what might be the uses for those textures. So all these samples are just really bridges between scientific tests about the deposition of clay onto a surface or to create a surface and um, samples about the behavior of a robot and what the possibilities might be for creating building facades or new kinds of bricks or masonry units that might cloud a building or one might construct a building with, or how we might see this as a scaled endeavor of building much larger using this technology someday. My interest in building from materials of the landscape, my interest in the political dimension of building, and my interest in additive manufacturing have started to come together in some interesting ways. Um, you may remember several years ago when the leader of the previous regime said there were bad hombres at the US-Mexican border. And he didn't say there were bad hombres at the border. He said there are bad hombres. And an hombre is a gradient between light and dark in the art community, in the, in the hairstyle community. This is, might be an, an, an hombre. I don't know if one is a bad hombre on the left and one is a good hombre on the right. But it's this gradient and synthesis of materials. So I wondered how we could make those kinds of gradients present in that process as well. And these are some very early studies of mixing and blending materials using 3D printing uh, called the bad hombres. And they're using clays from what we were at that time was a democratic state and a Republican state and stitching them together. And of course, the different hues and textures to make a political object. There's also a technological object that demonstrates how you can see simultaneously the distinctions and gradients and blending of two different things. And that we might consider something not to be so binary as we might perceive it at first glance, but in fact, uh, there's a complex nature to it. Taking that project a bit further, we traveled to the US-Mexico border, worked with 25 ceramic artists from Juarez, Mexico and El Paso, Texas, as well as professors from the University of Texas, El Paso, to visit sites of clay harvesting 
that were used traditionally in the region, but also new sites. And we discovered a whole range of complexions of clays from whites to reds to browns, even green. And we asked those ceramic artists to make pots using an additive manufacturing process. Now, ceramic artists don't necessarily know how to 3D model nor how to use a 3D printer. So we created this very simple software called, that we call Potterware in which we could create a curve that simulates the shape of a hand on a potter's wheel so that anyone could make the kinds of objects that we began to make six years ago and put that power uh, in the hands uh, of anyone. And now this software is being used all around the world in universities and, and high schools and colleges and uh, art organizations. And while we wanted every ceramic artist to make at least one pot, so there would be 25 pots, they ended up being so invested in this project, they made over 270 of these objects by the end of this project. So some of our endeavors in taking this to a larger scale have been projects like the Cabin of 3D Printed Curiosities. This is a project where we took advantage of a relaxation in the zoning laws in the San Francisco Bay Area due to the housing crisis, where anyone could build up to 1,200 square feet in their backyard without consulting an architect or going before the planning board. So we use that as an opportunity to explore the possibility of using our technologies to make a small detached living unit. Um, we used that technology to make about 4,000 of these cladding units made out of ceramic using this process of, of wiggling the tip and deposition so that every single um, ceramic tile appeared different in the physical world, although it was absolutely similar in the virtual world or the digital world held in place by a 3D printed ceramic backing, I mean, a 3D printed backing. The front of this cabin, the front facade, explores other materials that we have been invested in over the years, uh, like 3D printed cement and 3D printed wood. And we even used 3D printed Chardonnay grape skins from the waste material of the wineries in Sonoma and Napa Valley. And each of the tiles can hold succulents that grow very well in the Northern California climate. The interior of the house explores experiments in bioplastics made out of corn and hemp. Um, and the translucency of that material allows for the interior to become a lantern itself and to take on different kinds of moods and qualities during the day or night. And that the building can transform because of light and shadow and the subtle relief of each tile, drawing from the traditions of pressed tin, but in this case where every tile can be absolutely different. Even the furniture was an exploration in 3D printing. The interiors at night, the transformation to a place to sleep and transforming of the mood of this place that explores a new way of building a building. Our goals in direct deposition of materials and not components were an exploration is how can we take this technology at a much larger scale. And that opened up very different questions for us because this was the goal. The goal was to print structures this large using that technology, but it required us to take on not only the material, but the hardware and the software. We'd already addressed the software through the beginnings of the maker of, of Potterware, which intentions were to drive a machine at much larger scales. But I made this sketch about five years ago and sent it off to a collaborator uh, who has now commercialized this machine. Um, and it's a machine that we devised that can print lots of objects at once. And we're starting to use this machine uh, with communities to create economic development projects in which they can produce pottery on their own, even if they're unskilled craftspeople. And we're doing this in Tijuana. We're beginning to have conversations about doing it in Uganda and in Sudan, but these machines can also print one large object as well, which was the goal in this case to how we print much larger. We also had to think about how we move massive amounts of material. Um, and these are early experiments of what I would call a manual 3D printer, where we're just trying to think how do we push massive amounts of clay through a machine? And as we improved, we became much more confident 
that the portability of this printer would allow us to go out into any landscape, harvest the material of that landscape, and 3D print with mud, as has been done for 10,000 years of civilization. And so this began the project called Mud Frontiers. We think about it as mud because we are printing with mud, but we think about mud as a acronym for mobility because we can go anywhere with this very portable machine and ubiquity because the material is ubiquitous around the world and democracy because it allows anyone to use this software and the hardware and the material. Um, and these are some of our early experiments where the first time in these expanded borderlands, we are using additive manufacturing technologies to print the beginnings of ideas of, of buildings and spaces and forms and components as well as functional pottery by just harvesting the material of the landscape itself. I'll talk about these experiments because they're akin to the G-code clay experiments that we did six years ago at a small scale on our table. But now we're thinking about issues of lightness. Typically earthen buildings are extremely massive, but now we can print three inch thick walls because we can corrugate the material, which gives it uh, enormous amount of strength and it becomes very lightweight. We're also thinking about the technology we might use to light these structures uh, in remote environments. We are thinking about how uh, we can print and begin to print elements of architecture such as stairs and floors and insulation cavities. Um, we have embarked on thinking about how these can be served to allow us to make functional pottery using the same uh, harvested clay from the region and different kinds of structural possibilities and new kinds of textural possibilities that operate at different scales, like the insertion of juniper to hold two widths of a wall together structurally, but also thinking about programming these spaces, the beginning of the printing of furniture and fireplace, a gathering space. And so these all become study models in a way at a full scale using 3D printing and using a material that is, comes right from the landscape. And now, our table and a 3D printer is no longer the site of the production, but it's a landscape becomes the site of the production. And during the pandemic, this became the studio. This became the site where we can explore the possibility of what it means to be able to make structures at very large scales um, and to explore different aspects of production like trebiated vaults and domes or uh, lintelless openings and fenestration, um, the qualities of space and light and sound and the phenomenological qualities. And now we're pushing into the efficiencies of production, being able to print with mud requires the material to have to dry in the sun and wind. And so we would print and wait and print and wait. But with the development of being able to move the machine because of its portability, we can then print and move and print and move and we're beginning to create multi-cellular structures, rooms uh, that are programmed with the possibility to make structures that are approaching a house. And that was the primary project for the time that we were in COVID um, in a project that we call Casa Covida, casa meaning house, Covida, while looking like COVID, is actually a word that means cohabitation and a house for two people that's programmed in different ways. In one cell, there is a place to sleep. And we're collaborating with local weavers to make uh, woolen blankets and pillows and textiles out of churro sheep uh, from the region a place to eat and stay warm and cook using the functional pottery that's 3D printed from the clays from the region and a place to bathe from the water that's drawn from a deep aquifer and a place to see the stars and the clouds. 
and imagining how the borderlands is a place of hybridity where language and food and culture and belief systems of different people come together in different ways. And we are hybridizing new ways of building, bringing technologies and that are new and technologies that are old together, but also imagining new possibilities for even a roof that's defined by an, an inflatable pneumatic structure that keeps the rain and sun out, but imparts different qualities of light and space to the interiors. More recently, and ironically, we're working at a place called the Frontier Drive-In, which is being developed as a place um, for watching drive-in movie films, but also for staying. And we're now building the first permitted 3D printed earthen building in the world, which will be an eight module cellular structure for bathing and soaking and watching the stars and clouds at 8,000 feet above the sea level um, using only the soils from the site. The political dimension of design and architecture is extended into other uh, disciplines of design for us, like graphic design. But during the time that we were out in the field building these structures, um, we consistently heard news of child separation at the border. You all remember that from uh, a year and a half or so ago, where children were being taken from their families. And we wanted to contribute to that dialogue, not being able to attend the protests that our friends were uh, attending in cities, being out in the middle of nowhere. And one friend asked us to design a poster for them so they could take to the protest. And we wanted to build on this particular sign, which you may be familiar with, which is a sign that was placed on California highways to warn motorists that immigrants who were dropped off alongside the road by human traffickers may run across the road. And so these signs were placed so that uh, motorists would not accidentally hit uh, people running across the road. But this sign has an interesting story in the borderlands. It was designed by a Navajo graphic designer working for the California Department of Transportation who saw the plight of the immigrant today as that of the Navajo during the long walk when they too were displaced from their landscape and migrated to the places where the government now places them on those reservations. Um, he, this empathy translated into him making very particular decisions in this sign. He used a little girl with ponytails to, um, because he thought that's who motorists might empathize with the most. And he used the silhouette of the civil rights leader, Cesar Chavez as the head for the father. And so to make this sign it made one simple move, which was to turn the family to face each other. And we made this poster open source so that anyone could download it and friends began to use it in the protests. And we made larger signs uh, that were hand painted um, and it caught the attention of the Four Freedoms campaign. And they invited us to bring this sign back to the highway in a way that we would have never imagined before, which is in the form of an enormous digital billboard where hundreds of thousands of people would see this sign each day. So it became an idea of how does one smuggle art and design into the landscapes where it doesn't typically exist into the context of communities who do not have access to design, but to be able to also tell messages that are important to those communities. Um, you can see this on the walls of the St. John the Divine Cathedral in Manhattan at 110th and Amsterdam. Artists continue to download these signs and mount them all over Los Angeles. Um, and the sign as an art object also became a political message at the um, Johnson Museum in Cornell, New York for an exhibition on immigrant art. And so this idea of smuggling activism into these contexts became a really interesting idea for us that we can be able to speak volumes through design and bring light to issues. And this was also present in a project that we did uh, called Teeter Totter Wall. The Teeter Totter was originally an illustration in response to stories that we were collecting when we were witnessing the construction of the US-Mexico border wall in 2006, which mandated the construction of 800 miles of wall. And during that time, 
uh, we made an illustration that was demonstrating the metaphor between US and Mexico relations, that the border itself could be a metaphorical fulcrum between labor balances and trade balances uh, between these dichotomies of wealth and poverty and the equalities and inequalities that are present at the border. And we created these drawings and, and models. This is little models that we frame as souvenirs or recuerdos to remember this time that a border wall it was built and what a crazy idea it was, but also to tell and remember the stories that are, became about as a consequence of the wall. This particular illustration of, of many uh, resonated with many people and especially arts organizations around the country. And we're invited several times to see if we could realize this teeter-totter at the US-Mexico border. Um, often uh, municipalities would share their enthusiasm for this project, but the Department of Homeland Security and US Border Patrol said absolutely not. And so they denied us the possibility to do this. But we wanted to see this project through, even if we couldn't realize it in reality, we wanted to understand the ramifications of what it meant to build this conceptual and metaphorical project at a one-to-one -one scale and what the ramifications of that would be in terms of logistics and, and fabrication for this to exist in the world. So we designed the ways that it might be slipped into the wall. We designed it for a very particular site and a different, a particular kind of uh, wall at the border. And we went so far as to visit the border and carry large scale objects to the wall to see how fast US Border Patrol would arrive both on the US side and the Mexican side. And we had the teeter totters fabricated in Juarez by some friends who have an arts organization called Colectivo Chopeque, uh, whose primary goal are to build housing for for people in need in Juarez and in the outskirts of Juarez. Um, and this is the very first test of this conceptual project that we're working on. Because it was, it was being realized at a one-to-one -one scale, we had to think about how do we smuggle in the design into the site? And so this became no longer a metaphorical fulcrum, but a literal and actual fulcrum of how the border and the border wall could, could support that structure and how it would be mounted to it. Working with Colectivo Chopeque, we thought about the meaning of this as a structure. It was interesting to us that we're taking the same exact material used to make the wall, but turning it horizontal rather than, rather than vertically. Um, not to divide people, but to bring people together. So using the raw steel, but we didn't want to keep it the material of the raw steel and to stand apart from it. And as we were thinking about colors, we collectively decided on the color pink because in Juarez, the color pink has a very particular meaning. Uh, in any time you see pink crosses in Juarez, it, mem it memorializes the women who were killed during the time of violence in Juarez when Juarez was one of the most dangerous cities in the world. And we wanted to remember that while this endeavor was imagining play as a form of activism, that we are also moving through this project on a site of violence. And so one day we simply were exacerbated by the continued news of child separation at the border and the continued news of of new wall construction at the border. And we decided that since those teeter-totters existed in Juarez and they were designed and built for this place that we should just do and enable an event that brought communities together at the US-Mexico border anyway, without asking any permission, just simply going to those communities and say, would you like to do this? And they, were, they agreed that it would be really great to do. And this is how that they went. <laughs> We've been visiting these communities in Anapra, uh, Mexico for over
over 11 years at that time. And there was, a, there was a good 10 year span between the initial sketch of the teeter totter uh, drawings and this day when, when we realized it, it was a very small event by the families from Anapra and some friends and families on the other side. And what we discovered is that we had been thinking so much about the possibility for design to influence and transform the space around the wall. And that the wall itself as a federal project is public space and that we could decide what to do with that wall. Border Patrol did arrive within eight minutes as we anticipated and asked what we were doing. And they said, okay, we're having an event with children. They said, okay, and they stood their ground and they took some pictures and smiled. Uh, later, the Mexican National Guard arrived and asked what we were doing. And we told them we're having an event with children and they too smiled and stood back and took some pictures. And I realized that the event was attended mostly by women and children mothers and grandmothers and aunts and they defined that space they owned that space they created a sanctuary around that space in which they provided safety and joy for their children and families and in this interest of thinking about new ways of building i think there's new ways of building by thinking about how we can unbuild unbuild walls that divide us and make new connections and that we can actually do that and do the most possible with the least we can. And, and I think we made and created a new narrative of the border that day, that rather than what we hear in the news about this being a no man's land where nobody lives, but the bad men are doing bad things, we're able to show the world that this is a site where women and children live every day in the shadow of the oppression and violence of the wall, but can experience joy despite that violence and oppression. And that very much like the metaphor of the drawings that day, uh, nine years ago, that we produced to illustrate these stories, we find that the teeter-totter is this amazing playground equipment that requires the generosity of someone on one side, giving that generosity to the person on the other to experience that joy. And I think that's why this project resonated so much around the world because it showed to the world for at least 40 minutes that the actions that take place on one side have a direct consequence on the other. So thank you very much. Ron, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your work with us. Uh, really, really inspiring. And I can see from the uh, comments in the chat uh, that I'm not the only one who feels that way. Um, I'm also just so grateful uh, to have this opportunity to, to chat with you. I think for me, one of the, the things that I'm so interested in talking to you about is uh, how sort of you, unique your journey is. Um, and, you know, especially as, as someone who's, who's, uh, who's leading a school, I think we are so interested in exposing our students to uh, the so many different ways in which uh, we as designers can can practice our craft, and and I and I just love that uh, the way your practice sort of sits at the intersection of culture, technology, art, activism, you know, and then there's this confluence uh, that, and that's what really I think elevates it and makes it so powerful. And, and can you uh, perhaps uh, share with us how a little bit about your journey, sort of how how your practice took shape, uh, how did it evolve, and and did you always sort of come into it with with the, the lens of activism? Is that something that 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 came out of your experience? Uh, just be really curious to, to hear more about that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Trevor. I, you know, journeys are complicated and have lots of different paths. Uh, I would say that the you know my my journey is is fairly particular because I I come from a particular place in the world uh, where my family has lived for a thousand years and there's particular issues around that and of course as 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 you know when you go to architecture those kind of journeys are um, are also oppressed right that there's a certain way that uh, architecture and its dogma 
attempts to indoctrinate students. And I was certainly indoctrinated as well, uh, looking towards, um, let's say, the, the, the white male European model of what a modernity uh, uh, of architecture uh, and what that is and, and should be. And it took quite a while for me to recognize the importance of uh, the places where I was from and the places where I drew inspiration from, which were not necessarily Western ideas of what architecture is or should be. And I think a, a very pivotal moment in my own journey was that I was living, both myself and my partner were living in New York City during the time of 9-11. And after 9-11, we moved away and all of our projects began to take on a political dimension because we realized how important the actions that we uh, participated in uh, what we, we recognize the consequences of the actions that, that we were participating in. And, and we, for many years, we described our practice as a post 9-11 practice. And it seems so far away now, 9-11, that uh, we may not think about it anymore just as, as a memory. But for those of us who were there, um, it was certainly impactful. And that was the big shift, for me at least, to think about a new way to define how we might build a design practice, one that looks away from, from the making of, of the aspirations of the making of skyscrapers, but to think about what it means to build a skyscraper and why a skyscraper may have fallen down. You know, I, I, I love that. You know, I think you, you said something uh, in your talk and somebody commented in, in the, the chat about building by unbuilding, right? And I've, I'm thinking a little bit about what you just said in terms of sort of unlearning your, you, you know, the, the dogma, right? Um, and I'm, I'm curious in terms of uh, issues of equity, how do you begin now as an educator and a, and a practitioner, how do you impart that to your students, right? Because I mean, I think, uh, you know, I think a lot of us have taken a moment uh, to sort of rethink some of the, th the things that we, we took as sort of gospel uh, when we were uh, learning. And, I, and I'm curious, how, how do you bring that to your students and, and how do you, you bring that lens of equity uh, sort of and political activism uh, to, your, to your students? Well, I, I try to do it in a number of ways. Some are very direct. For years, I instituted a class at Berkeley, which is now a kind of staple class, although I don't teach it anymore, called Design is Activism. And I, I just, like the very first day, I would explain to students what, act, what I thought activism is or what defines an activist and what defines a designer or what design is. And demonstrated that what an activist does and what a designer does is very similar. They both work with different constituents to make change. They have to work within or challenge in some ways the, the, the quote unquote laws that might shape something and question them and to think about how they can transform and work with change. Um, and many of those things are the same. There's like eight or so, so points that I think are the same. And the one difference is that it, that is different from a designer, but that an activist must consider is that an activist may be willing to risk being arrested for their efforts, but a designer is, isn't. Um, the designer doesn't go throughout the world in his, his or her profession thinking they might uh, need to get arrested for that. And so it brings up a very important question to me about how willing you are to uh, stand up for what you believe in. Um, and, and I think certainly we experienced that day when we decided that we were going to do the teeter-totter wall. But I also think about it in ways in education and design that there are certain, uh, I will do like a quote unquote standards of what design is or needs to be based on um, the dogma of a profession that's dominated by particular voices. And that design, if, if you think about it from a, an aesthetic standpoint or a clientele standpoint, has particular standards. And many students who don't participate in that culture of those standards don't even understand those standards. I certainly didn't when I went to architecture school, but I, I recognized uh, very early that 
oh, I must be wrong in my assumptions about what architecture is. And that's often what we do, right? We, we break down the assumptions of what a student thinks architecture is instead of nurturing the possibilities of what architecture could be from them. I remember very clearly in my very first architecture studio, the professor saying, buildings aren't that thick, but every building that I had grown up in my life was really thick because it's made out of mud. Um, and so it had to be thin. And so I started to say, well, okay, buildings are thin and buildings look a certain way and they're, they're white and they're straight and they don't have ornament. And I want to, or I'm trying to encourage novel ways about thinking about what architecture could be, how it looks, who it's for, why it exists. Um, so those are maybe the two ways I can think of offhand that bring to these questions of, of equity. Well, thank you. No, that was great. You know, and I think as and as a profession, we were so, we've we've been really late to the party, right? And um, I, I'm curious from your standpoint, how do we, you know, uh, how do we sort of amplify? And you spoke about how you sort of deal with it within your classroom, but do you think that there are ways of us, uh, uh, let's say, playing catch up or amplifying? this work uh, within the profession and within, within professional practice? Mm. I mean, for, for, uh, I'll be honest that for years, we had what I was imagining a professional practice, um, but it was a professional practice with desires to work with particular kinds of clients. Um, you know, one of, my, one of my architecture heroes is Hassan Fati, the Egyptian architect who worked with mud brick and, and was born in 1900 and who saw and hoped that his client base would be um, the other 99% of the planet that didn't use architects. I mean, it's interesting back then he was thinking about this idea of the 1% and he wanted his client base to be the other 99%. Um, and we too wanted our clients to be the other 99%. And we worked a lot with um, communities and thinking about design build and Guys like Samuel Mockby were very influential at that time. But I have to be honest that I was not good at that. I was certainly no Samuel Mockby. Um, and even though I was from those ki kinds of communities, I, um, I could not seem to find ways to deal with small budgets, to uh, bring people together uh, in ways to come to consensus about working together as community, that was really difficult. And I had, you know, Samuel Mockby was the model, I guess, that existed at that time. And certainly many people became successful at those ideas of design build and working with community. But I thought those were excellent models of, of rethinking uh, the practice. And in my own admission of not being good at that, I think at the point where we moved to California, we took a very different approach, which was to rather than have clients to take a pause and to simply reimagine what was possible and use the tools of the profession, which, which are model making and image making to communicate these ideas. And that's where we found much more traction in saying that the world could be a different way. And let me show you how that world might, what that world might look like. And so, there's there's been a I'd say there's been a movement lately against the ideas of of representation and the render and there was certainly a point where those things got out of control right there were these uh, websites like inhabit or can you remember some of them but they were just showing like renderings of how the world is going to change because this thing is going to collect all the water and produce electricity and like it was just taking on big huge social issues through the production of an image and I think that was that was kind of an exciting moment for architecture and certainly one that I miss. Um, but I think it's about the profession being able to take a pause and recalibrate itself. And the world is taking a pause through different movements like the Black Lives Matter movement. I think the world is taking a pause uh, during the pandemic. But I wonder if the profession is taking a pause in the same way. Um, during World War II, Le Corbusier shut down his own office uh, for almost a year and wrote this small manual on how to build housing and schools made out of earth in France. 
because he wanted to see how he might house all those who were coming back from war, who were displaced by war, and like reignite the possibility of architecture being uh, a discipline that could be transformative. And he just also took a pause. And I, I think we can learn from that to take a pause and just recalibrate how we're thinking about the ways we shape our environment around us. So I know that we have a lot of students uh, watching. So one, I, I love your plug for Sam Mockby. So uh, for the folks who don't know who Sam Mockby is, I, I would highly encourage you to take a look at his work. Um, and uh, I was struck in your TED talk, um, you mentioned uh, Hassan Fathi, uh, his, the quote that you had up of his uh, saying that architects do not design walls, but the spaces in between them. And one of the things that I'm, I'm struck with your work is that, that you not only are you sort of dealing with placemaking, but that, you, that there's a, a in, in my mind at least, there's a, a layer uh, surrounding culture and identity um, that, that sort of adds to the richness that, that we were talking about before. Can you address that at all, or speak to that? Mm. The role of culture and identity within within design. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's it's in my in my work, it's very personal because I think it goes back to this idea that I I unlearned my own culture and identity through architecture, and now I'm uh, reinserting it into uh, architecture and design, and that that took a very big big leap. But I, I but at the same time, I talk about the hybrid a lot, and how the borderlands are a hybrid, and how uh, yes, I went to school and I learned a lot of new things, and it was really about folding those together, marrying them together, rather than displacing them. I mean, the, I think the university is very much a, a, like a colonialist practice that can say, okay, here's what you are before you enter the university, the university colonizes you, and now you are this. And I think, you know, hybrids are, are interesting because um, they transform what is born of two or more different things in different ways. You know, I, I think the, the borderlands are certainly, uh, they can be very violent, they can be very rich, they can be very funny. Um, and all these things are born from that because it becomes a, like a cauldron of like, you know, an interesting laboratory as my friend Teddy Cruz calls it of, of ideas and, and synergies, um, but it also can be repellent as well. And so I think that, this idea of identity is that that students' identity should be nurtured as they move through a university system, and that really it's it's a folding of new possibilities onto all of the possibilities and ideas that came before in their own becoming. No, that's so powerful. I I I, I feel so strongly that that we've we've done such a poor job um, historically in terms of allowing creating space. Uh, for the celebration of, of, of those cultural uh, differences. So we're coming up on time and I wanna make sure that we have some uh, time to get into the Q and A. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Fatima that's asking, what is the lifespan of mud when it comes to hot temperatures? I know in Mali used mud as a main material for building homes before and even now. Yeah, the lifespan of mud is, um... Mud buildings are the oldest buildings on the planet. Uh, they're the most long lasting uh, buildings. It's the longest lasting material that we have uh, evidence of. I mean, it's, it's what defines our civilization. For most people, in most students in architecture school, I think they say, well, it's so exotic building in mud, how novel and how alternative. And, uh, but it's actually the status quo of building materials for the last 10,000 years. Um, and it's something very important that we should recognize as architects. I, I teach a class um, uh, called 250 Things an Architect Should Know that builds upon Michael Sorkin's uh, manifesto of the 250 Things an Architect Should Know. And one of those points is that every architect should know the fundamental principles of mud architecture. That's great. Um, Jessica asks, what traditions inspired the patterns of the ceramics? Oh, that's, that's an interesting question. It, the traditions of mathematics, I'd say, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, it was just really about uh, what clay would do when it, the nozzle started wiggling instead of 
doing what it was supposed to do, which was to make the object perfect. I mean, it's a glitch. It's a mathematical glitch that we have control of. And so we're always now thinking about uh, what that glitch can do in terms of textures and, and surface, but certainly we can apply images to it. And so that adds an entire other layer when we can transport images that may be cultural onto a surface and what that means. I mean, because certainly there's questions, there, there's such careful questions about when one is uh, culturally appropriating or versus learning. And so I think sometimes um, we're, we try to be very thoughtful about that, but all those patterns are really saying there's a sine wave that has this kind of frequency and this kind of amplitude. And now there's a sine wave that has this kind of frequency and amplitude. amplitude. And so it's a, it's a mathematical tradition, I'd say, to start with. I'm going to add in one of my own questions just real quick is, that I had on, on that is that I, I, I imagine that the form is, is one part of, the, is one part of the, the science experiment, right, in terms of what, what you can do with the material. But then there's the, the chemistry of the material itself. Can you speak a, a little bit about sort of understanding the properties of the clay and the different types of clay um, mm. and, and, and some of the work that you've done there? Yeah, I mean, certainly we've been kind of less chemists than than cooks in the kitchen of 3D printing and trying different mixtures and different recipes. Uh, in fact, our book about 3D printing is called Recipes for 3D Printing because we're mixing things up and seeing if they work. And when it comes to clay, clay has this beautiful plasticity and quality. And there's a lot of clays that their, their chemistries or their clay bodies, as they're called, have already been discovered. When we go into the landscape, that's when new questions open up about what kinds of clays are used, what their temperatures are. And that's also a grand experiment. But there are, of course, ceramic artists who know how to do those experiments very well. And when it comes to 3D printing, the large scale 3D printed earthen structures, that knowledge comes from my own knowledge that was passed on to me from my father and my grandfather and elders in the community about where to draw those soils and what kind of uh, soil compositions it needs to be, what it needs to feel like. And so for me, I can actually grab that clay and hold it and squeeze it and I know if it's going to work or not. Um, but there are new complications because we have to run it through a pump that goes to the 3D printer and that pump has its own constraints as well. So it has to be calibrated to that. So there's, there's always a lot of learning about traditional knowledge versus knowledge that has to begin to think about the, the, the needs of a machine or the needs of, um, of, of code. And so that structure that we just started at the, at the uh, Frontier Drive-In, that is an, is an engineered structure that had to pass, the material had to pass structural compression tests in order for us to build that. Uh, we have a quick question. I think uh, Ben's asking, how long does it take to print the backyard cabinets? And is the, are the materials all locally sourced? Yeah, all those materials on the backyard cabin were locally sourced. I, I mentioned the clay is, is a clay from here from California. The Chardonnay grape skins are from Napa. The sawdust is from the Sierra Nevadas. Um, how long it takes, we didn't really time that one. We, it was just such an experiment. We're saying, okay, now we're going to make the outside. Now we're going to make the inside. And um, the structure itself is not 3D printed. It, it's much more about the cladding in that case than the, than the structure itself. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, can you repeat the acronym for MUD uh, from Troy? Oh, it's uh, Mobility, Ubiquity, and Democracy. Yeah. Uh, but this is kind of moving around on my side. So it says, when, it comes, when it comes to building housing, architecture is one of many other trades. How do you see, the, see other trades, say electrical or engineering, incorporating their work into the 3D printing uh, utilizing mud in a large scale. Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, I think we touched on it in the cabin a little bit. It's not so electrically engineered, but all those LED lights are certainly there's an array that's fairly complicated behind there that, I mean, to me, it was complicated, probably not to an electrical engineer, but I, I'm super interested in how we might integrate componentry of lighting and, uh, and, and I mean, all of the integrated, um, uh, so forms of infrastructure, water, drainage, everything into the earthen building in ways that might be uh, 
a bit more sophisticated than a hole in the wall. And so I've been thinking about the reinforcement po uh, possibilities of, of earthen structures and seismic conditions by being able to simultaneously um, integrate a, a stabilizing material during while it was being printed. It's a great question here from Samuel. It's asking, uh, have you considered use of other abundant materials, uh, possibly artificial substances like post-consumer waste? Um, yeah, I just dropped a link to uh, Sawdust, which we started a company called Forest. Uh, it's F-O-R-U-S-T dot com. Um, so that uses the waste of the construction industry for the making of building materials. And we now launched that. That's, a, that's now um, a company that is under the umbrella of Desktop Metal, which is one of the largest metal 3D printing companies. Um, but we've done lots of work with, with car tire rubber. Um, I'll just, if you want to see the, that, I'll just go to emergingobjects.com and I drop that link in as well. So car tire rubber, um, plastics, uh, what else? Um, I think those are the primary two that come to mind. And, and the sawdust, of course, of thinking about Oh, and, and um, fly ash is something else we have worked with as well. So, yeah, we're, we've been working on those questions for a really long time. Thank you so much. I think we're at time. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks. Really great discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ronald and Trevor, for this compelling conversation around equity and design. You've certainly given us a lot to think about and thank you to all of our audience members for your insightful questions and thank you, thank you to our partners, the Walker Art Center, AIA Minnesota, MSP NOMA and Minneapolis College for making this series possible. Please check out the other talks in the series. The Walker will be hosting the next talk on September 30th at 7 p.m. Seku Cook will be in conversation with Paul Bachnight. Uh, you can register at the URL listed on this page. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Trevor. Thank, Thank you, you. The audience. Thank you, everybody, for joining us.